historically one of the best protections of the value of money against the inroads of political spending was the gold standard, the redemption of money in gold on demand. This put a check rein on the politician, Warren Randolph Burgess. Hello and welcome back. Let's continue our Servantine journey through history's most important novel. Justifications of absolutism in defense of the state have unintended consequences. When foreign policy concentrates power, we overlook domestic corruption. This is the lesson of the chapter's conclusion. Just as Sancho starts worrying about spies and military attacks, a farmer arrives at court with a petition. A courtier claims the man is harmless. He's a harmless soul, and either I know nothing, or he's as good as the bread of life. The narrator confirms this. From a thousand leagues away, one could tell he was a good man with a good soul. And so does the man. I married, tied the knot of peace before the Holy Roman Catholic Church. But our narrator's trustworthy in Don Quixote is religious identity really proof of moral rectitude. As if to confirm the unreliability of appearances, right after the man claims to be married, he notes that he is a widow. Moreover, his wife was killed by a bad doctor. A bad doctor killed her. Recall that doctors are metaphors for political advisors from Plato to Cervantes. The farmer prefaces his petition with a tedious but hilarious description of his circumstances. His son is set to marry a maiden named Clara Perlerina, proof that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. She's bright in some ways, but horrific in others. She's like an oriental pearl, and when looked at from the right side, she's like a flower in the field. From the left, not so much, because she lost her eye on that side when she got smallpox. Did you know, in Cervantes' day, syphilis was known as the French disease? Her surname signals that she's from a line of perlaticos, or sufferers of palsy, that is, partial paralysis. It's worse, she's missing teeth, has multicolored lips, stoops such that her mouth touches her knees, and her hand is withered. She's like a portrait by Picasso. Pardon me, Sir Governor, if I go into such detail when painting the parts of the woman who, in the end, is to be my daughter-in-law. Recall Don Quixote's metaphor when declaring his eternal love for Dulcinea in the previous chapter. The girl makes an odd impression on the soul. Note how the farmer's circumlocutions are a metaphor for exactly how corruption works. Appeals for help layered over with distractions. Once we feel sorry for Clara Perlerina, the farmer informs Sancho that his son is also a mess. My son is possessed by the devil, and from having fallen into the fire once, his face is as wrinkled as parchment, and his eyes are a bit watery. But he has the constitution of an angel, and if it weren't that he punches himself and beats himself up, he'd already be beatified. Quixotic mission. Who killed the wife of the pig farmer who solicits money from Sancho? A, a doctor. B, an astrologer. C, a tennis player. Correct answer, A, a doctor. His petition, then, is for Sancho to write a letter to convince Perlerina's father to allow the marriage. This seems reasonable enough, right? Well, that's not all. One more request, if I may, although it shames me to say it. I say, sir, I would like your grace to give me 300 or 600 ducados to help me with the dowry of my son, the bachelor student. Sancho is outraged and again threatens to throw his chair at his interlocutor. Note how his reaction voices the logic of fiscal conservatism. You son of a bitch, scoundrel, painter of the very devil, you come at this hour to ask me for 600 ducados? And just where would I have them, you stinking pest? And even if I did have them, why would I give them to you? Tell me, you merciless bastard, I've not ruled for more than a day and a half, and you want me to already have 600 ducados? 
But a big irony arises here, since when does Sancho Panza, who stole 100 escudos from Cardenio and dreamed of selling all the citizens of Micomicon as slaves, actually care about the public treasury? The office makes the man, it would seem. Thank you for joining me in this chapter. Hope you can join me in the next one too. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.